All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this BCFA Friendsgiving celebration. It's a joy to be here to be part of this conversation with Nova Rensuma and Emily XR Pan. I'm Tanya Adelit, graduate of the MFA in Writing for Children and Young Adults program, summer 2019. I write speculative fiction for young adults and older adults, and I'm currently in Houston, Texas, on unceded lands of the Karankawa, Sana, and Coahuiltecan people. I am thrilled to introduce these two award-winning authors who together create an incredible online and print anthology while continuing to write their own beautiful, surprising, lyrical, and tender stories and teach and inspire writers and readers around the world. Nova Rensuma is a New York Times bestselling author and two-time Edgar Award finalist. Her novels include A Room Away from the Wolves, The Wolves Around Us, Imaginary Girls, and Danny Noir. She has been published in several short story anthologies, and her next novel is forthcoming from Algonquin. She is an MFA in fiction from Columbia University, has taught creative writing at the University of Pennsylvania, and is core faculty in the Writing for Children and Young Adults MFA program at VCFA. Many of her books have roots in the Hudson Valley where she grew up, and she now lives in Philadelphia and unceded lands of the Lenny Lenape people. Emily XR Pan is the New York Times and national indie bestselling author of The Astonishing Color of After, which won the APALA Honor Award and the Walter Award. Uh, Walter Honor Award, excuse me. It was also an LA Times Book Prize finalist, long listed for the Carnegie Medal, and named by Time Magazine as one of the 100 best YA books of all time. Emily received her MFA in fiction from the NYU Creative Writing Program, was editor-in-chief of Washington Square Review, and was the founding editor-in-chief of Bodega Magazine. Her next novel, An Arrow to the Moon, will be published by Little Brown in spring 22. She currently lives on Lenape land in Brooklyn, New York. And together, Nova Ransuma and Emily X. Pan created an online publication of YA short stories called Foreshadow, a serial YA anthology, with the intention of offering, quote, a unique online venue for young adult short stories, committed to showcasing underrepresented voices, boosting emerging writers, and highlighting the beauty and power of YA fiction, unquote. The print edition, titled Foreshadow, Stories to Celebrate, Celebrate the Magic of Reading and Writing YA, was published by Algonquin Young Readers in October 2020, just over a year ago, which is wild to me <laughs> that it's been a year already. And I've been incredibly fortunate to intersect with Nova and Emily in a variety of ways. As a student in the Writing for Children and Young Adult program at BCFA, I was in a focus group with Nova. We were up in our fourth floor area, and she was also my fourth semester advisor, guiding me expertly on my creative thesis and graduate lecture. I've also taken classes with both Nova and Emily outside of BCFA through Manhattanville College and the Center for Fiction, and my short story flight was selected by Jandy Nelson and published in Foreshadow and was included in the print anthology. And through all of our interactions, I've been inspired by the attention to detail, the love of craft, and the deep respect and regard both Nova and Emily hold for the written word. In Emily's introduction to the Foreshadow anthology actually starts with a love letter to fiction, so I'm actually going to read a paragraph from that to sort of kick us off. Tell the blank page a story, and it will tell you who you are. It will shine back at you the quiet undercurrents of your mind. Peer into those waters and you'll see your swells of confidence, your sleep stealing fears. Storytelling, if you think about it, is the most human thing we do. It's a universal language. It's so instinctive, baked into our way of surviving and connecting that we do it without even thinking about it. This is how we connect. We share experiences. We tell of what happened. Many of us even conjure our stories up out of nothing. So I'd love to start there and leap right into a conversation that I hope will meander through the genesis of foreshadow, your own writing practices, sustaining your creative selves, and why short stories fascinate you. So to that end, I'm going to start off with what I hope is sort of an easy question, but I hope will also get us into some fun, fun narrative spaces. What stories inspired you to become writers? And what are the stories that continue inspiring you today? Um, I will I will jump in because I was I was thinking about you know where where did this love of short stories come from in me and I I realized 
Um, it started working at a literary journal when I was in college. So that was my work study job. I went to a small college in Ohio called Antioch College. And there's a literary journal there called the Antioch Review. And so, um, you know, I, I would, my job was to like organize the slush, which way back in the 90s was not done via email. And, you know, it was like actual like mailed stories that I would type on index cards. Um, so I, you know, I would, you know, sometimes peek and read the slush. I wasn't like an official reader, but I remember one, um, you know, the editor had me read a story that was about to be published in the review. And it was a story by Amy Bender. And I, I think my just my universe exploded for me because I just, I, I loved her voice. I loved the strangeness, the surrealness, um, and that story led me to her, you know, the, her first collection that she put out, the girl in the flammable skirt. And there's one story in there early in the collection called "Call My Name," which I must have read twenty times. It's just like it, it, like I. I just wanted to write like that. I wanted to like have an imagination like that. Um, and I feel like that's when I started to seriously really think about the craft of short stories and just aspiring to write them. And it really started from that, that little work study job and Amy Bender. <laughs> It, my brain is forever exploding because Nova and I are twins in so many ways. Like we, we have the exact same reading taste. And um, I always think of the girl in the flammable, the girl in the flammable skirt, specifically the story, the rememberer. I spent mm. years trying to craft a story that felt like the rememberer that captured that same um, sadness and 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 the the feeling of letting go of someone that you love and and what that means um so I love that you mentioned that because for me that was uh kind of a guiding star was me trying to reverse engineer how she wrote that story and figure out how to write my own um for me I think it the the interest in stories goes all the way back to when I was a kid I was not uh, read to as a child by my parents. My parents were like, you, you got the reading thing figured out. You can read books to yourself on your own. Um, instead, my dad would invent a, a short story on the spot, uh, basically whenever I demanded it, which was constantly. And he was extremely skilled at this. And I did not appreciate how difficult that is until I was older you know, to be able to entertain a child and craft a, an entire narrative arc with characters who I was deeply invested in. And of course, as soon as I was old enough to be bossy uh, and have my own opinions, he started to say, well, let's create a story together. Let's like orally talk through a story together. And so it became a, a bedtime tradition. Every night, you know, we would decide what story we were going to tell and we would act it out with my stuffed animals. And so I feel like I've been telling stories since way before I even knew how to spell words. And short stories were my first attempt at writing um, any, any like complete narrative experience. So for me, it kind of feels like my lifeblood and it feels very much like um, Short stories are, are just as important as novels because sometimes you need that, that shock of an experience. It would be kind of like, it would be almost like somebody um, saying they don't need a television episode because they can just subsist on, on movies, right? Like uh, they feel like two, two forms of a medium that I just need as much of as possible. So that I so I wasn't really conscious of the the importance of short stories to me until I guess I got to and I was writing them as I was growing up but I guess it was when I got to college and I started taking creative writing workshops and then as I decided to apply to MFA programs and I was like oh I gotta I have to turn in a portfolio and they surely don't want to read a rambling third of a fantasy novel or something so I got to put together short stories. And that was when I started really obsessively looking at the craft of them. And I found Amy Bender around that time. I love this idea of um, in your childhood telling stories and building them as a nighttime ritual. But that link of then turning that into actual 
doing the short stories, not just keeping as an oral tradition, then moving it into actually writing yourself. That also takes a lot of courage and intention. That's, that's fantastic. That's really awesome. Um, do you still, do you still practice oral storytelling? How does that go for you now? I, you know, I should, shouldn't I? I think I, now I'm too anxious. I'm like, I, I got to pin down the words. Um, I think, I think for me, t- pivoting from oral storytelling to writing was very natural because my mom is a writer. She writes creative nonfiction in Chinese. And I grew up watching her sit there at the keyboard, you know, plucking away at, at like, making her sentences perfect and and muttering them out loud to herself and reading them over and over again and I would kind of sit next to her and mimic her and pretend like I was writing as well when I when I was a kid so then it it was a very natural progression for me to be like well I tell I I make up fiction with my dad and I watch my mom crafting these essays I want to craft something of my own Uh, I think oral storytelling is a is a an underrated thing that that we should be trying to get back to, but of course the perfectionist in me wants to be able to assemble the words into the perfect shape and rhythm before I, before anybody gets to see them. Absolutely that. Yes, I understand that perfectionist instinct very much. (laughs) But I'm also wondering what is it that the short storm, the short story form offers to you? You mentioned, you know, kind of the, the TV show versus the movie, the the song versus the album. So what is it both in the perspective of a reader and as a writer that you can't find in a novel that you can in a short story? Or perhaps what is it that you're seeking from short stories that you don't look for in novels? Um, Yeah, I, you know, it's interesting. It's like, you know, I'm sure all of us, like, you know, we want to go and read something and sometimes we're in the mood for just like this intense burst of something. And then sometimes we just really want to like be, you know, deep into something for days. Right. Um, So for me, that's, that, that really is what it is when I want um, just an intense, an intense burst of a feeling um, an escape or something like that. I often turn to, you know, reading a short story collection and I have like a bunch of different like collections, like in the midst of reading where I, where I'll like pick pluck and like read a story from one writer and read a story from another writer, like depending. And I think, you know, as a reader, that's, that's what, that I feel like it's that certain like mood that I'm in a different mood for, for a different work. As a writer, it's really interesting because I'm often very like clear that this is a novel idea and this is a story idea. And I, for some reason, I never like question, could, you know, could this be, should this be a short story? No, this feels like a 300 page tome, you know, should this be a novel? No, this feels like I only have this to say. And it's really focused on like, often for me, it will be focused on like a culminating scene or moment. And I feel like when I'm thinking of what a short story idea for me, I'm always thinking of that one, it's, you know, a scene usually toward the end of the story, p- possibly the climax, maybe the, the final scene. And it's just like, I'm writing toward it. And I always have like a, a, an image of it. It could be very specific. It could be vague, but it's like this piece that I know that I'm doing and it feels contained. Uh, and it feels, you know, like something that I can um, really like immerse myself into very like incisively and deeply. And then with a novel, it's just, and at more of an exploration and more of not knowing and more of like, you know, reinventing it as I go. Um, so like, I'm ne- I'm always, you know, very clear on what the project is when I, when, when, when I have an idea and it just, you know, depends on like where I am, I think in my writing, uh, in my, you know, in, in, in the place of like creative expression, um, I find that, um, you know, short stories are an opportunity to try something that I've, I'm sort of like afraid maybe to tackle in a novel, uh, you know, like a genre I'm not comfortable in um, or some some kind of like plot thing that I don't know if I could pull off. And it's maybe it's lower stakes or maybe it's just like just so focused that I just feel like, you know, like, the you know, all the distractions are out of the way. Um, so that's, you know, where it goes for me when I'm writing. Uh, but what I've been doing lately is I've been working on a long novel and then in between when I get very frustrated with the novel and I just want to, you know, just like tear up pages and like make a big mess in this room, um, then I will go to one of my short stories and it feels 
I don't know, it's, it just feels like rejuvenating. We, like, it feels like I can find, you know, the reason that I like writing again, and, you know, and when I return to one of these short stories. So in a way, they're, um, they're kind of like, you know, mental health breaks for me <laughs> lately. <laughs> How about you, Emily? Um, well, I agree with everything you said, Nova. I, I also think that there are certain styles that can only work as a short story. You know, I'm thinking of like the the run on sentence short story, or you know, um, certain voices would you wouldn't be able to sustain across an entire novel. And so I I hunger for those experimental forms, and I love that the short story uh, allows us to capture so many things and, and play with so many different things that you know might be it might be impossible or impractical to to attempt to do as a novel. Um, I think also when I'm when I'm reaching for a short story, it's I want to crawl inside a specific moment, like a very human moment, um, a very uh, like a you know a slice of an experience and just mull over it. That's usually what I'm craving when I go to read a short story, whereas reading a novel feels like oftentimes it's like I'm living an entire alternate life, right? Like um, I'm, I'm like walking side by side with these characters and, and seeing how they change and how they think. And, and, you know, the, I think the way that my brain works when I'm experiencing novel is very different from when I'm experiencing a short story. And during the pandemic, uh, especially during last year, when, when things were like, just constant garbage fires, constant, constantly feeling like we were just being pummeled on all sides by bad news. I really could not sustain the attention to read novels. It felt like it required this like suspension of disbelief that the world around me was not so horrible that I could indulge myself in escaping into a full novel. I like my brain couldn't do it, but I could read short stories. I could read these short things where it's like I take an hour or two um, or maybe less than that even. And I just immerse myself and spend a little bit of time with these characters or, or thinking about these other conflicts. Uh, and then I could reemerge and, and like Novo was saying, it was like this mental health support for me. So I, I think there's, there are a lot of reasons why um, short stories I think are so valuable. I think as writers, how do you learn to write a story from start to finish and make it satisfying? You know, make it gripping, get your reader invested, have that full narrative arc, pay out everything that you set up. How do you learn to do that if you're only ever writing a novel? It feels like you would have to pour so much more time and energy into finishing novel after novel after novel to learn the same lessons that you could learn if you spent some time writing full short stories. Not that you can't write novels, but just that a lot of those lessons of like, okay, what does it feel like to pay out everything? What does it feel like when you reach the end and, and you've created like a satisfying experience or you've presented this character experience to completion, to your satisfaction? You can learn that lesson so much faster when you experience it through the process of writing a short story. And it's not that I don't, I do not think writing a short story is easier than writing a novel. I think people who say, who say that short stories are easier are fooling themselves. Um, but it certainly takes less time, right? It's going to take less time for you to write a first draft of a short story versus a first draft of a novel. It's going to take less time for you to go through one revision round of a short story versus one revision round of a novel. And because it's a short story, if ultimately it doesn't work out, you don't, it doesn't feel as much like it can, I think, you know, writing a novel and then working on it and really chipping at, away at it. And then after maybe years of work on it, realizing, oh, this is not quite there and I need to shelve this project. Maybe I'll come back to it one day, but I need to, it needs to go in the drawer for now. That can be so devastating. And it's much easier to do that with a short story. It's much easier to be like, well, this was a short piece. 
you know, I, I can write another short piece like this. But the thing about the novel is that writing it and editing it, it's a, it's this really intense marathon. You know, it's much easier to be like, yeah, of course I'll do another sprint. Like, let me catch my breath and I'll do another sprint. It's a little bit harder to be like, oh yes, I'm going to spend all the rest of my life marathoning again and again and again and again. And we'll hope that one of those marathons gets me somewhere satisfying. I, yes, I'm going to start using that a lot. <laughs> I remember Nova and I talking about this during my fourth semester that my brain also works and I need to have multiple projects working at the same time. Um, and part of that is to be able to hop over, try a different craft element out, see how a different kind of voice works or a different POV. And again, part of that is sustaining myself as a writer. Some of that is inspiring me back into that first story again, or back into the novel project. But giving, your, giving myself a little bit of an escape path was always, always really helpful. I, I remember that, Tanya. And I remember, like, I love how you, do, how you did that. It's like you have, like, a mosaic of these things that are happening in your brain. And, like, they're, like, different, you know, pieces. And you always found a way to work on short fiction in the midst of your semesters, even when working on a novel. Like, you found a way to, you know, shift, shift your focus and try different things. Did it feel the same like that, you know, like, like we're talking about how it's the, the intense focus of a short story as opposed to the, the possible slog of a novel? <laughs> for you? Absolutely, absolutely. I think, I mean, I like to write from a place of uncertainty. So taking on writing projects that I'm not sure I can finish, which is probably not great for a sustainable career, but <laughs> taking on little things and challenging myself. And oftentimes that will become short stories or occasionally now I'm trying to do flash fiction. And that is so hard. A thousand words. I don't know how to do that, but I keep trying um, because what I can learn from that short piece from just really honing in on an emotional moment or a character or a single, single aspect of plot, just one tiny little detail, what can I learn from that that I can apply back into the larger novel project I'm working on? And sometimes it's also really fun to just play around with different POV. I'm still, one day I'm going to finish a story where it is second person. One day it's going to work. <laughs> And being able to flip back and forth then, and what do you learn about perspective from that? What do you learn about storytelling? How does character emerge differently? And how can I take some of those lessons back to a longer, larger project? So I keep doing it. <sighs> I love that. You're inspiring me now to think of like that's that flash fiction. I feel like all of us here in this in this Zoom room, maybe some of us will be inspired to try something like that. It is so hard. <laughs> It is so difficult. Um, but I also wanted to ask too, your stories, both of you always tend to incorporate or usually tend to incorporate some sort of fantastical element, whether it's ghosts or transformation or magic of some sort. There's always this beautiful, fantastic element that you work in. And what is it about the wondrous that really calls to you in fiction? What is it that you're hoping to balance out or what are you hoping to highlight by using that in your, in your work? For me, it was that when I was a kid growing up, I so desperately wanted to find magic. I so desperately wanted to, you know, turn over a rock and have there be like a secret opening to another world. Um, every single time I read anything where it was like magic or, or, or a magical world could exist side by side with the world as we as we know it i would end up just like completely obsessed with trying to find out whether it was real or not uh i remember the first time i found like a book about fairies and i was so confused for like 3 years i was deeply confused about the realness of them cuz i i felt like they had to be real and i was walking around everywhere looking for them and i was constantly I had to you know I read Narnia um I read the all of Narnia when I was uh in the second grade and then had to check the back of every single closet and every single wardrobe for years and and so when I incorporate things um that are magical or strange into my writing it's it's me calling back to um that that hope 
that I always had. Like I always wanted there to be something weird and something, um, something unbelievable that I could believe in just around the corner. And that's what I try to capture. So it's very important to me to try to have things feel like the real world, but make you believe that, yes, there could be this bird um, that might like deliver you a, an impossible package, or yes, there could be magical fireflies. You know, okay, I, so I have a confession, which is, um, you know, when I started writing short stories, even though I was inspired by Amy Bender, it's almost like I didn't have permission to go strange enough or weird enough or write the fantastical. I think this may have been, uh, you know, a part of, you know, the MFA program that I started straight out of college, um, which was very different from what we all know here at, you know, the, the MFA at BCFA, which is just, you know, the permission to do and try anything really, um, that didn't feel, I didn't feel that same, you know, openness and freedom and, you know, excitement um, in my MFA program. I felt more like this is what a short story is and I need to be writing this kind of short story. And so um, my work at that time was all, all completely realistic. Um, and, you know, I, bet I, I wrote, you know, novels, tried to get an agent, um, completely realistic, was not able to get an agent um, with uh, with the work and, and my short stories, you know, placed in a few places. But I, I, I feel like I didn't really find my voice until I discovered two things, which was YA, you know, when I discovered, um, you know, YA novels, and I discovered the, the, the genre bendiness of YA novels, and how so many, uh, you know, beautiful literary works include you know this the twists of the fantastic and I just a door opened for me and so I you know I just I like barreled through like thrilled and excited and it was at that point the it, the convergence of discovering YA that I started to allow um, the surreal and the strange and the fantastical to enter my stories and I very quickly you know got an agent at that point I got published like all these things happened and it's like I wasn't I wasn't really fully myself as a writer. I felt like I had to be a thing that I wasn't. I just wasn't that kind of writer. And then when I found what, you know, what I was, it was the, it was, you know, the, the fantastical and, and the otherworldly. And I think, you know, now when I think of, you know, whatever I'm writing, there always is something, some kind of twist like that. I can't kind of keep myself away from it, even if it's a subtle, a subtle thing, or if it's, something that you might interpret and you could interpret it in a different way. Uh, and I think it's just, it speaks to who I really was that I was just kind of trying to like, you know, pushing down, um, you know, all, all the, all the years of, of trying otherwise. And it's just, it, it feels like I can be more honest, you know, as a writer, when I write about the quote unreal, you know, something, something is, is uh, freed up in me. And, um, yeah, so I, I don't know how I'll, I'll ever stop at this point. <laughs> don't. <laughs> I'm so glad because, again, your stories are so gorgeous and working those fantastic elements in just ground ground them, which sounds funny for it, but grounds them in this in like this metaphor of real in a very different way, in a really charming, emotional, lyrical, tender way. And oh, thank you. <laughs> I was like, Corey McCarthy uses the term genre flirt. Um, mm. and that's one that I love that idea of just skimming through and pulling these ideas together and finding those texture and you know those liminal spaces between and that's such a such a lovely way to think about it there's also like that idea of being like in a romance with your own fiction which I love mm. too I love being in love with the things that I'm reading um, hopefully also writing but <laughs> certainly pulling that together um and I want to kind of take a quick moment then and like start talking about the move from discovering YA, the move from embracing yourselves as authors of fantastic fiction, YA fiction, and moving into then deciding to do Foreshadow as a project. Um, it was a bold new venture in online literary magazines. You had monthly issues slated from, it was December 2018 through December 2019, so 13 issues and I just kicked my paper over, um, 13 issues um, with three stories per month. So just a monthly issue. How did you decide on that particular format? How did you decide that that was 
what you wanted to do, how you wanted to highlight these particular stories, mm-hmm. knowing that you're also busy. <laughs> yeah. uh, we, you know, the, the, the story has, uh, we've told before is, you know, we've, we connected, we both had this vision and this dream to publish, have a venue for publishing YA short stories, which I think all of us know is sorely lacking in the industry, um, especially for unknown writers to find a place to place their work. And, and Emily and I were just, you know, had the same dream and were inspired to, to create something together, which, um, you know, that synergy of working together. And I remember um, we, we had a planning meeting, Emily will remember, at uh, the Selka, which is um, a, a restaurant in the, in the East Village. Um, and I think we had like pancakes or pierogies or something. <laughs> um, and it was, uh, we were there for like five hours <laughs> and we were like trying to figure out like the parameters of what our idea will, would be. And I, um, I was just being like really ambitious, you know, just like, and I didn't publish all these short stories and we'll do this and should we do it every you know should we have an issue every three months and all this stuff and then we, we kind of were like figuring how to limit it to you know to have it be something doable something that we could fundraise and pay the writers and actually be able to pay people and I I really believe that um I don't know if you remember this Emily but I believe that it was you who had this vision of like a set time you know, we could do it in a set time. And then we talked about like, what if it's one story a month? And I was like, well, what if it's, what if it's three? Like, I remember like, just kind of like pushing and pushing. And then we like, just had this vision and it just sort of felt like, I don't know, like this gift, like a year of YA short stories, you know, like, you know, three a month. And it just became, um, I don't know, something that felt doable because maybe it was finite. It was, you know, like a thing that we knew we would be fundraising, you know, and having a goal for. And then it became, uh, I don't know, a reality in a way that was one of the most exciting experiences I've had. I don't know if I'm remembering it in the same way that you remember it, Emily, but it just, what a a lunch that was. It was, it was really magical. I mean, Nova and I both had this background because we both had done MFAs that were um, in the adult literary space, which is very heavily focused on short stories. Uh, if you, if you do an MFA, that's not focused on, on writing for children and young adults. There's, it's, it's almost like a, a lot of programs discourage you from even workshopping novels. So everybody is writing short stories. Everybody's reading short stories. And we had both been working on literary magazines uh, as we were doing our MFAs. And we, we both uh, were submitting to, liter- had been submitting to literary magazines. And so it's always felt like this space that just kind of never flowed over into YA. You know, like like the, the literary magazine experience is huge in the adult literary world and in a, the adult speculative world. So science fiction, fantasy, literary magazines, they've, they've existed and they've been paying their writers. They, I mean, you know, props to them. They've been paying their writers since way before literary, uh, like adult literary, literary magazines were paying their writers. And uh, most of them, I would say, still don't pay their writers um it's kind of like you get published and you get you get the prestige of being in this mfa programs literary journal and then you get compensated in the form of two copies of their print issue if it's in print right like that is your payment and you're supposed to be grateful for it and so the key thing though was that we'd been seeing how ya anthologies had been taking over and um and and gaining popularity but it still at the end of the day, each of those anthologies was still a curated group of already published authors who already had agents, who already had voices out in the world. And we wanted to try to have that option that the whole reason literary magazines exist in the first place is to allow fresh blood to come in, right? Like we want, we wanted to be there discovering um, new voices, uh, when Nova had the, Nova and I had this like long Google brainstorming document trying to figure out what we were going to call it. And when she put down the word foreshadow, I was like, oh my God, we're foreshadowing what readers are going to be loving in the future. Like we're foreshadowing the next authors whose names are going to take up spines on the shelves. Like that's the way that we wanted to view this project. And so 
it was the the format of it being a serial anthology um, and the like three stories a month was as as Nova said it came about in in a, a kind of like a this melding of dreams and practicality because Nova was just like and it'll be this epic thing and it, it might go on forever and I was like whoa 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 I was like you want to pay everyone we need to know how we're gonna pay everyone and so that was when I was like okay so let's let's like slim it down and figure out how to make this workable, how to actually have boundaries that like we can operate within. And so that was when we were um, starting to shave it down to just a, a year long project, but you know, it's not really an anthology if it's being doled out um, in these small batches. So that feels more like a magazine, which was the original idea. So then hence the serial anthology. Um, but once we figured that piece out, then it was, I think everything started to make a lot of sense uh, and organically rolled out from there. Like then we ran our Indiegogo crowdfunding campaign. Then we had an incredible, an incredibly robust staff. Uh, I see that our, our managing editor and queen of slush, Diane Telgen is uh, in the audience. Um, she definitely, you know, kept us sane through the entire process. We had an incredible, we had like 25 volunteer staff members uh, to create this for us. And we, we wanted it to feel really special. So we wanted the back end of it, everything behind the curtain to feel like this mashup of the way a literary magazine works. Like if you are on, this, on the masthead of a literary magazine at a, an MFA program or something, we wanted it to have that feeling, but we also, Nova and I both worked in publishing. Nova worked in production and I worked in marketing. And so we were intimately acquainted with what things are like behind the curtain in publishing. So we also wanted to bring in that experience. And so we kind of, you know, mashed the two together to try our best to create this really special publishing experience for both uh, the, the writers that we were, you know, picking through their slush and ultimately sending on to our uh, selectors who then chose their favorites and that became our new voices. We wanted that to feel really special and unique. And we also wanted everything behind the curtain, the experience for like our readers and our volunteer staff, all, um, all of our volunteer editors, we wanted that to feel really unique as well. Yeah, I'm, you know. I'm curious, Tanya, you, your story was selected and mm -hmm. um, by Dandy Nelson, it appeared in issue nine. What was that like for you from your end we you're hearing like our planning on this end like yeah <laughs> well it was incredible I mean first of all being selected was phenomenal then being selected by Jandy Nelson was amazing um and I had read I'll give you the sun uh, I think the year before uh it was one of the books that I had read for um VCFA and just fallen in love with her voice fallen in love with her storytelling um I had it was the first time I was like, oh, maybe I could try to do dual narrators, maybe, possibly. So feeling very inspired by her. And then to have her pick the story was just incredible. Um, and you, I mean, it's always one of those funny things of, you know, lectures at BCFA, talking to faculty members, talking to published authors, and they'll mention things about getting an editorial letter or talking about, you know, getting your packet letter back even and taking a couple of days, putting it aside, taking it a couple of days, then opening it up, then giving yourself like emotional space to really sink into the comments. And I got my first editorial letter and the process was so generous. I don't, I think I've been primed for like a terrifying editorial process and it was incredibly generous. Um, my editor was Sharon November, who I'm, st I, I still go back and read that editorial letter every once in a while, just to get Aww. the inspiration and to remind myself about what she saw in the story and what she also was able to draw out of the story. Um, and I have been published since, thank goodness, luckily, um, and uh, have not had as wonderful an experience <laughs> since. I think Sharon totally spoiled me because the, again, the level of detail and the level of richness in her feedback is not what I've seen since. <laughs> she is brilliant. <laughs> Utterly brilliant. I'm so happy it was a good experience for you. It was phenomenal. Um, it was really, really wonderful. And I keep looking back on that as such, 
such a great introduction um, and also such a confidence boost, <laughs> feeling that, yes, I can send things out. I have stories that um, other people will want to read. And that is such a, such a magical piece of the process. It was interesting to me too, because you were very particular about how you designed your selection and editorial process. Um, I am actually now slush reading for a, a YA podcast. Um, and it's a very different process from what I've heard about how you designed yours. Um, so not only were you seeking out new voices, but even the path those stories took, as you were saying, you know, they were selected, you know, there were the slush readers went through the next level and then selected by an author who introduced them. How did you come to designing that part of your process? That's, you know, very intentional, very different. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I know, you know, we, our goal was to just get uh, to spotlight, you know, a, a, a diverse group of writers and stories and really get the word out and get readers to read these stories. And, you know, readers, especially in YA, you know, like they're, maybe not looking to read unknown writers as much and so we were thinking like how could we get you know not just like putting them in the in the anthology or putting them in an issue like how could we get the eyes on them how could we get the attention and we thought of you know if we could find like the superstar uh, YA authors of the moment and we could somehow have them like kind of blurb a story, you know, like select a story from the collection that we gave them and then like introduce it and offer up, you know, some a blurb of words that, you know, someone would would see and be like, oh, I want to read this. And we were very intentional when we chose the selectors and then which stories got sent to which selector, because we were trying to find, you know, the kind of stories that that particular selector would be interested in. Sometimes they gave us some parameters and other times we just like what we knew of their books and what we knew of, of their writing. We tried to like match them with ones that we thought like they're gonna see the magic in this story. You know, and every story that we sent to a selector had went through our round of reading with the readers, coordinated by wonderful Diane making, you know, like with rounds and like rated and like really seriously had a lot of love from our staff. So there were a lot of stories that we didn't even get to publish that were beloved, uh, you know, among um, all the stories that were submitted to us. And then, you know, in those collection of those beloved stories, the, the selector got to pick the one that most resonated with them. And we felt that, you know, would give a, a special spotlight. Yeah, and it definitely, that had such a logistical impact. I cannot even... Like it, it sounds really great in theory, right? We were like, oh, this will this will work so well. It'll be awesome. And then when we when Nova and I sat down to talk through the process, we were like, wait, <laughs> we need to we need to make sure that um, you know we get to we get to read all the the stories. We get to choose our favorites too. We we want to make sure that like all of our editors are excited about the stories. Um, and so it became this really convoluted like there was this this flow chart i guess of like readers would read that the our, our reading team our slush reading team would read them and upvote their favorite ones and then the best of those would go to our content editors um who the ones who would actually be you know working like sharon did with you to carve a story into its final form um they had to read them and tell us their favorites what they would be excited to work on and then from the best of those that got upvoted, Nova and I would read them and see what we had fallen in love with. And then we would look at our list of people who had agreed to be selectors. And obviously we couldn't overwhelm them. So we could only send a limited number of stories to each selector. And then they would read, get back to us. And then we would pass the process back down, right? Like be like, okay, so, so now this editor, um, you know, gushed about how much she needed to be the one to work on this story. So we're assigning this story to this editor. So it was just um, the the logistics of it um, were, you know, we really, we really uh, desperately needed Diane, who was our, you know, our, our taskmaster, who kept everything on track for us. But that uh, was such it was such a complicated process, like a more complicated, I think, than anyone might understand just from being like, yes, we had selectors pick our, 
um, or new voices for us. Uh, but it, it also, for me, I, I mean, no, I don't know if um, if your your lip mag ran contests, but for me, I also drew inspiration from how um, when I was editor in chief of Washington Square Review, we would do contests where we would have some rock star author pick the winners, um, and the contests would very much have this specific workflow of like okay the submissions come in and like we the slush readers process it and then it gets passed onwards and a small selection gets sent to the um the author who's reading for us so it was so for me that was very much uh in the back of my mind inspiring me as I was like trying to think through this this puzzle of how to get all these pieces working together I will say I mean it's I understand just how complex it was, but on my end, it was just, it was so caring. I felt so cared for throughout the entire process. Um, I mean, obviously I had to wait. That was, that's always a little nerve wracking, <laughs> but then once things got going, it just, I felt so cared for in this process. Um, and so when I think about, you know, just the whole experience of being part of foreshadow, it's felt again, so generous, so, um, so giving. And one of the things that, um, it really demonstrated for me was, I mean, this, you know, going back to the Indiegogo campaign um, through the, those deliberately placed story introductions um, was just that, you know, there is an existence of an incredible, thriving, excited, invested, supportive writing community. Um, it absolutely opened up my landscape. Um, I have a critique group uh, with some friends that I made through that. I've had other uh, connections going forwards from Foreshadow as well. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, now that you are an out, a year out from the publication, what were some of the things that it opened up for you both? What were some of the, the parts of your writing community or writing landscape that have changed and shifted um, and hopefully become richer? I mean, for me, case in point, I'm going to be joining the faculty at VCFA um, next year. And I'm so thrilled. And I don't, I don't know that I would have been, you know, on their radar so much if I hadn't done, oh, thanks for the love in the chat, everyone. Um, you know, I, I think foreshadow definitely opened a lot of doors for me that way. Um, I've you know, had so many amazing teaching opportunities and I had already been teaching beforehand, but, you know, getting to do the anthology, that was, that was definitely a door opener for me. I think, you know, in all honesty, like getting to read all these short stories from so many different writers, because there were times when like, I, I knew, like, I would just like peek into the slush inbox and like, you know, just, I just love, I think it, it came from when I was, you know, my work study job, you know, I just have this like a, a love of slush. Um, I, I just, I feel like I found the renewed love of writing fiction from doing this project because, you know, I had written um, short fiction. I had I'd written short stories, you know, years before, and then I was focused on novels and novels and novels and novels. And I would write a short story every once in a while for a, an anthology if I was, you know, solicited for it. But it wasn't until after Foreshadow that I started earnestly, actively writing so many more short stories. And it really was inspired by, you know, the beautiful stories that we got to publish Yours is one of my favorites, Tanya. It's so inspiring to me. So I find like, and every one that we published in, you know, in this, the, all the new voices that are all collected in the print anthology, every one has this spark that I love that inspires me. And I just feel like it gave me, it made me find like a part of myself that I had almost forgotten when I was so focused on writing novels. So um, you know, there was so much I, I gained from, you know, working on this project and, um, you know, learned, at, you know, in terms of editing and in terms of like creating, you know, something that's viable. Um, but at the same time, it also like, you know, gave me that personal creativity and inspiration. And I feel like that's like the, the thing that right now I'm thinking about that, that, I, that I carried away from this. And I'm so grateful about it. We also had both always dreamed of having uh, having the uh, opportunity to do an, a print anthology. So it definitely yeah. fulfilled that dream for both of us. Yeah. And I also love that in the print anthology, it's not just the stories. We still 
get to hear so much from both of you from, you know, the mini analyses of the stories themselves to the story prompts, the introduction and the closing, even the interviews with the, the editors as well. Um, again, just like deeply respecting the process and bringing so much more of it into the print anthology, including the masthead. Um, there's so much in there that I, I just keep going back to and just getting so excited about that you really did expand the project out. Um, and what was that like taking it from here's our online publication, now we're going to create this other creature entirely, add on to it, reshape it, reformat some of the things. What was that process of creating a whole nother creature from something you'd already spent so much time developing and, and it was the world. It was so tricky because we so wish we could have published all of the stories, you know, um, because foreshadow was not like our new voices were definitely the highlight, but we had an amazing collection of stories from established authors, you know, uh, and, and some some extremely rock star beloved giant authors who I'm like, I'm still amazed that they took the time out of their schedule to write a, a story for us to help us uh, raise up this platform. But so, so it was like, there was that little bit of heartbreak of, oh, it's, it's sad that we can't include everybody because then the book would be this thick. Um, and at the same time, it also felt so special. I remember early on, when we were, it was, we were still just like in our, our dreamer days of like, well, we don't know if there will ever be a print thing, but like, if there is, I texted Nova and I was like, Nova, what if the print thing was just the new voices? Um, and then we both got so excited about this idea of, you know, give the entire purpose was to give new writers, people without like a, a long CV of publications, um, this chance to have this exciting publication to make some noise, to get eyes on their pieces. And then how exciting would it be to have that digital feature be made into a book? So we could bring all of these new writers into an actual print edition and have them have this physical object, this beautiful thing that they could hold in their hands. So that was really exciting. And then just trying to find ways to make it really special. I mean, it was really our, it was our editor, Elise, who first started floating I, around the idea of like, well, how do we make the, the print edition feel like really unique? Um, and so then Nova and I were like, oh, well, we'll write craft pieces. We'll talk about, we'll, we'll celebrate the short story. Yeah, that that was the part that was such a surprise. Like we never intent, we never went into the project of foreshadow, realizing that there would be this particular book at the end of it. You know, we always had that that dream, that little secret hope that we'd whisper to each other, "What if it became a print version?" But like we never, we never like knew for sure, and then we hadn't envisioned that it would be something that is for readers, but it's also for writers. It's for teachers. It's, you know, just for anyone who wants to like take a look at the YA short story from whatever angle they're coming from. And so, you know, the book became its own like little treasure that we didn't, you know, we, we never, we never expected, you know, thanks to the inspiration from our editor at Algonquin. And then just like, you know, the, the synergy that em Emily and I have when we get to work together and we talk about the stories that we love. You know, we were we were like fighting over who would write the <laughs> the craft piece for which stories, you know, like because we just loved every one of them. And it was just like to have to only choose one person to do it for, for each story. So it was it was a really wonderful experience. I still can't believe that it happened sometimes. Um, and then I look and see I can see on the, the screen there it is on my shelf and I'm like, it happened. It's real. Mm -hmm. <laughs> real oh it is a physical object it's online there's so many ways of accessing it it's so phenomenal um we're starting to to edge towards the end of our time together but i do have just a couple more questions and then sort of closing remarks um but i do want to know are there pieces of writing advice from your own teachers and mentors that you carry with you uh, perhaps that you can share with us and or perhaps were there pieces of advice that you wish you'd had when you were a writer earlier in her career? Mm. 
I'm, just, I'm thinking back to my <laughs> to what my my teachers long ago um, told me and um, trying to think of of you know what like what I carried with me I think you know it's it's interesting I feel like there's so much that I've learned as a faculty person at VCFA sitting in the audience listening to craft lectures and like from my fellow co-faculty that I wish that I had when I was uh, you know finding myself as a writer when I was when I was a young writer and I think you know it's 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 more than just like writing YA and writing for children. I think that there's something special that comes um, in our program that is very different from you know other programs. Um, and I can't you know I could I could go through a list of all the things that that the faculty have have given to me that I wish that I carried with me but back into the past into who I was. Um, and I, you know, I guess that's just what's coming up is that the wisdom that you find later on, you know, you always wish that you knew then, but in a way, I think you have to kind of like find your way toward the writer that you're going to become and you have to stumble and you have to like, you know, you know, make the mistakes and have your, your novels living in the, in your drawer, which I have a couple of those, um, to get to that place. So yeah, that's, that's what's ro rolling through my mind right, right now. What about you, Emily? I'm thinking it's it's kind of like the the age old advice of you should read everything, right? You should you should read constantly. You shouldn't discriminate between genres, between age categories. Every every single piece of narrative writing has something to teach you. Uh, whether you would personally try to write something like that, whether you love it or not. Uh, things that you hate reading have also something to teach you. Um, but more importantly, that you have to, this is, this is uh, what a, a, a teacher in my MFA program, who I feel like really taught me the importance of reading, um, imparted to me, you really have to reread things, uh, especially when you're trying to understand craft. You know, your first time reading through a story, it's kind of like your first time driving to a new place or walking to a new place. Like you're just following the GPS. You're like learning, okay, I turn here and, and you see everything for the first time. And then you arrive at your destination. You're like, ah, this is where I was meant to arrive. And your second time through, your third time through, you start to notice the landmarks. You start to notice, oh, there's a crack in the ground here, or that building's kind of shaped weird, or those trees must be really old or something. You start to notice the details. And every single time you reread, you understand more intimately where the seams of the story are, how it was put together. And you are able to notice things like, oh, this writer was setting up this detail here so that they could pay it out 60 pages in, you know, or 200 pages in. You don't notice those things being set up your first time reading. And so, you know, everything we need in order to learn to be a good writer is there on the page for us. It's, are we going to do the work to put aside, you know, we sort of have to take off the reader hat and put on the writer hat and reverse engineer everything that we're reading. And it's up to us to do that work. And I would argue that that work is uh, just as important as any other work that I do as a writer, you know, to really make sure if I connect with a piece of writing, I'm going to sit down and reread it. I'm going to, I oftentimes will have um, multiple copies of my favorite books so that I can mark them up. Um, when I, you know, am teaching a short story, I always have the, the copy that I've marked up again and again and again. And every time I read it, I mark it up in a different color so I can see all the different layers of my reactions and all the different thoughts I have. And I can notice um, different things and literally stories that I've taught for years and years in every single workshop or class. At, even when I reread them now, I still always find something new. There's, I always find something new. Um, about how it was assembled, how it was, how the writer considered certain things or played with my expectations. And so that would be my big piece of advice that was passed down to me that I feel I have to pass along to everyone else. That was beautiful. That was fantastic. Thank you both. I have one final question. Um, and this is sort of a cheat. 
But during the foreshadow of virtual book tour, um, I was on a panel with Tanvi Berwa and Gina Chen, who wrote Escape and Fools, and they both have books coming out next year, so look out for those. But I want to spin one of your questions to us back onto you. And you'd asked us, what place does hope have in young adult stories? And how or where do you find it in the stories that you write? Um, yeah, I, I remember this question. I have been thinking about this a lot. And I think it's because um, I'm, you know, I, I've been teaching undergrads, uh, writing for writing wife, you know, creative writing class. And the last class is the class where we always talk about, you know, the hope in hope in YA and that class is coming up. So I've been, I've been thinking about this a lot lately and I've been thinking a lot about my own work. And I think there is, when, I, when I'm writing something that's YA, I do think about what I'm leaving for my readers, what I'm leaving for young readers, what I'm reading for, you know, whatever readers come to it in a way that I, I realize I, I don't think as much about, you know, like I think my endings, at least in the adult pieces that I'm working on, feel more bleak in a way. And I, and I don't, and, and I don't know why, like I've been thinking about this lately. I'm like, is this something that I think has to be done? Does every YA story have to end with a, a glimmer of hope? Um, I know that there are some writers who would say yes. I, I have um, some beautiful quotes that I often share that the writer Elizabeth Acevedo says about um, a glimmer of hope at the end in, in YA. And um, I, I wonder if maybe I've, I've held that in thinking about um, what I want to give and what I want to leave with, with a reader and that I do want to leave that glimmer of hope. So I would say that every YA piece that I write does, does contain that. Um, maybe it's because I'm thinking of who I was when I was young and wanting to leave something for, for that person um, or whatever, you know, person <laughs> might end up reading it who is like me or, you know, went through some of the things that I went through. Um, and it feels more and more important the more, you know, I move forward with my writing. So maybe that's that's why that's a question I like to ask other writers, because I'm trying to see, are you also thinking about this? You know, because I find that I'm thinking about it. I wonder, Emily, do you, do you think about that? I do think about it. And, and it's interesting, the, the distinction between writing, for, writing YA and writing adult. I do think that hope is kind of a, a defining line. Um, you know, you, you can have, you, you might come across an adult novel that is just so harrowing. Um, and at the end of the day, the book is just about that emotional experience. And if you were to take that same book and have the edit, have the writer rewrite it for um, for the YA market, I think you know they would be very much pressured to inject more hope. I think for me personally, and and maybe this is why um, I found myself in in the YA category. I think my writing all of my writing has something really sad and bleak to it, but all of it, I think, has something hopeful to it. And I think not even just, I don't, it's not even that I feel obligated um, to have it feel hopeful to me. It's that I, I'm also thinking that on my past selves, all my, all the various versions um, of past me that existed and how sometimes I needed to be taught to hope. And I think in, in our current climate, more than ever, you know, with everything that's going on environmentally, everything that's going on politically, every, everything constantly um, that we witness in the world, I think I, I never want to publish a book or a story that doesn't have an example in it showing somebody how to hope. That's beautiful. I think those are that's those are fantastic. Um, thank you so much. Again, we've gone over just a little bit, but thank everybody for being here with us, for spending this time. No, but Emily, it has been. 
phenomenal. So wonderful to spend this time with you. I also want to thank BCFA for putting on this excellent Friendsgiving celebration in general, for inviting us to be part of it in particular. Thank you to Jericho Parms, to Chris Green, Katie Rasmussen, Aidan Samus, to the LMX Affairs and the Institutional Advancement Offices. Thank you to Ann Cardinal. Thank you to everyone here who has joined us for this session. And I would like to close with the dedication that Emily and Nova put into the Foreshadow Anthology, hopefully as inspiration and hope for the writers who are listening and the ones to come still. For the writers waiting to share their voices with the universe, who trace fingers along shelves, dreaming of spines with their own names, who scrabble and dig for words in the dark and unholy hours, who know their hearts are full of tales and are just beginning to hope. We can't wait to read your words. The world needs your story. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Tanya, also for being so amazing. Thank you, thank you for this. Thank you, VCFA, thanks everyone.